Hello, everybody. I'm H.G. Tudor, and you join me for another Ultra interview, an opportunity for you to learn more about narcissism as a consequence of questions that I'm asked and the discussion that I have. Joining me is Dr. Julia Friedman, who has spoken to me previously. And Julia and I are going to be discussing, amongst other things today, the representation of narcissists in film and television and in literature. So we're going to give that topic a good old seeing to, as you might say. Julia, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Always good to talk to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, if you'd like to weigh in with your first question for me, and we'll take this subject by the scruff of the neck and give it the <laughs> analysis that it deserves. Okay. I'll start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you first notice your kind in books and films? I started to notice the similarity around the time that I was undertaking my A-levels. So one of my A-levels was in English literature, and I studied Wuthering Heights. And I started to notice similarities in behavior between my kind and the two uh, lead characters there with uh, Kathy and Heathcliff. So uh, I was, what, 18 years old. And at that juncture, I didn't yet actually know what I was. Um, as I've explained before, I knew that I was different. I knew that I was set apart. I knew that I was manipulative. I knew that I reveled in the hurt and pain of other people, but I didn't fully have the terminology or lexicon for it. That came a little bit later. But I recognized in the way that they behaved, there were certain similarities, mainly with other family members. Uh, I didn't necessarily see, although there were some aspects of Heathcliff that seemed a little bit similar uh, with myself in terms of being distant from people and um, keeping his counsel at certain times and uh, creating this uh, air of uh, mystery around him. But it was more with the behaviors of Cathy that I witnessed uh, similarities with family members. So uh, that was the first occasion that uh, it came to uh, prominence. I see. And uh, well, uh, without, this is probably an awkward question to ask you, but uh, d so did you empathize with um, um, any of the characters? As you know, I'm devoid of any emotional empathy. I might, I think a better description is that I would side with a character. I hadn't much time for Kathy. I thought she was uh, an attention seeker and weak. But with Heathcliff, I wanted him to succeed. I liked the fact of that, you know, he had come from a difficult background. Of course, he was found as a, an abandoned orphan on the streets of Liverpool and uh, was brought um, to Wuthering Heights and uh, was assimilated into the family. And that he dealt with the difficulties that he faced by taking them on. And he demonstrated a sort of uh, indefatigable spirit in terms of knowing what he wanted and how he go about it. And particularly, uh, again, because it's literature, so it's not always absolutely on the mark, but the metamorphosis that he went through when he went away, and it's never spoken of or written about rather as to what he did, but it seems like he probably went and did some soldiering. And when he came back, he wasn't this, um, the boy that was weak and, you know, like I think it was Hareton who was able to, or Hindley rather, who was able to give him, you know, would beat him and et cetera. But now he could best them himself uh, because he'd physically matured, but he'd also had some experiences where what he was, what he was in terms of the heart of him, became uh, more polished. Uh, not in terms of him becoming more articulate, but the 
rough hewn material that first existed had gone away and had been molded into something more effective. And I think it is a consequence of him doing some soldiering. So I particularly like the fact that when he came back, he was in a position to start putting a bit of stick about. And those that, of course, beat him up and mistreated him were then instantly put on the back foot because he had learned how to uh, use his talents. And of course, he didn't show any fear of these individuals because he had a greater level of uh, inner confidence. So when he returned, I sort of um, sided with him in the sense of remembering when I was a boy and I wasn't physically strong enough to deal with my tormentors. So I had to assert control a lot of the time by retreat. I wasn't frightened of them, but of course, one did not enjoy being uh, <laughs> physically and sexually abused. So that meant a retreat from my part, as I mentioned uh, recently about how I would then go and hide in various places within the house and climb up a tree. And then, of course, as I became older and I became physically capable, and as a consequence of the training that I've had, uh, that it meant that people knew then that they would, they ought not to cross me. Because not only was there a keen mind, that was razor sharp and reveled in their misfortune, I now had the uh, physicality to support that. So it's a little bit similar to the way that Heathcliff's uh, evolution was. And so, uh, as I say, I wouldn't emphasize with him, but I kind of sided with him. Right. So, but for you, what um, you saw in his behavior as he comes back and, and he, in fact, it's, uh, in, very interesting to me that you didn't mention that there's a, what a normie would uh, qualify as a series of acts of cruelty that he imparts on the people who wrong him. So you see this entirely as a restitution mm -hmm. and uh, just um, uh, uh, sort of allow him to uh, continue because there's a, it's absolutely true that he... Uh, he corrects the abuse that was imparted on him, but then he uh, begins clearly to uh, abuse others. Indeed, but that's merited in the way that one, he's been treated, <laughs> and two, uh, na mm -hmm. naturally, uh, that's part of who he is, and it can be seen. That's how mm -hmm. he gets his kicks. I mean, there were certain aspects of it which... Uh, as always, because it's a represent, uh, only a representation in literature that is not completely on the mark. So, for instance, his reaction to uh, Cathy's demise is one that right. uh, I wasn't particularly pleased with. I, uh, that wasn't in keeping with the way that I saw the character. But particularly when uh, they're on the limestone pavement and she's talking about, uh, you know, it's the... Um, looking up at the sky in one minute it's uh, sunshine and then there's a cloud brewing and it's used as a sort of a, a prediction for what's going to go on in with regard to Cathy's life and when he talks about the fact of uh, uh, you know, basically saying you know haunt me etc and uh, reciting the prayer and so forth all of that the intensity by which he operates uh, mm -hmm. the conviction that he has is something also that uh, saw me rooting for him I see. So, uh, but this, this is, that sounds to me like an instance when a character is uh, adjusted to uh, actually make the reader to, and I uh, used the word em empathize earlier, obviously, it was meant as a joke, but um, this time, so for the reader, the reader has to empathize with him. Mm. And, and then, so he's given certain traits that would not, I would imagine, accord with um, how you chart uh, narcissism. Yeah, uh, that's right. And it, it, it's, it's similar in the way that um, it's part of why I enjoy just moving to a different author for a moment with uh, Roald Dahl's work, mm. because invariably the children triumph. And it's not because I like children. I find them annoying. <laughs> But I was one myself. And um, knowing that I had, uh, that I was superior to an individual, but wasn't able to wield that superiority because of sheer physical difference, 
was a matter of considerable frustration to me. And there were instances where one could use a cerebral approach, which um, basically through the telling of lies and blaming other people that we could accord a result. But it was that whole thing of being able to sort of outwit the adults, particularly appeal to me with his work. So it's not about sort of supporting the underdog. It's just recognising that the uh, sort of inner malevolence that exists, um, the, the desire to see that come to fruition is something that I particularly enjoy. And of course, many representations of my kind that you see, um, one of the problems that manifests is that there are two things that the, uh, and you touched on it slightly there, there's two things that the creators or writers uh, pander to, which is understandable, but is not an accurate uh, depiction. First, of course, is that they're there to entertain. They're there to entertain through a book, not mm -hmm. necessarily always to inform. They're there to entertain through a film or through television. That's the principal aim of it. And therefore, if you have an individual who's unremittingly bleak in everything that they do, then it becomes pretty tiresome. And where somebody would be seen as, although I don't really like using the term, people use it, intrinsically evil, again, the other aspect of that is that they suffer from this um, need to always think that there's some good in everybody, and there isn't. And that is one of the issues which presents a problem for many people that are ensnared by my kind, that they are guided by what they see on screen and in books, where there is some form of redemption for that character who hitherto behaved and demonstrated many behaviours of a narcissist. And even when they were being pleasant, you could see that it was manipulative and it was for their own aims. And then all of a sudden they have this sort of road to Damascus moment where they suddenly realize, actually, you know, it's not it, it, it's not a good thing being horrible to people all of the time. And that somehow that this good has been cultivated by a mentor or some kind of guide so that that comes to fruition. And that always disappoints me and invariably causes within the Tudor household uh, an exhalation of, of, of disgust when I see that happen. Um, because I'd rather them be true to the, true to the character. But the problem is, is that people won't buy that because they have been conditioned to always expect that that everybody has some good in them. And there are certain characters, undoubtedly, who are that mixture of where they're a, a complex character. Mm -hmm. they're dif they are difficult, but they do have uh, moral fiber within them. But they're not narcissists but they're portrayed as being a narcissist, even if the word isn't used. And then it misleads people by suddenly mm -hmm. causing them to find this redemption. And uh, that disappoints me, to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. Well, that's probably, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a scramble between uh, narcissists and narcissism and general yes. lack of understanding of the difference. And that, that could yes. be one reason. But what... Uh, can you think of a character which was meant to represent narcissism, but uh, is an absolute flop or near to it? An absolute flop? Or near to it. Somebody who was supposed to be, who is... Uh, Off the top of my head, I can't think of somebody who was meant to be a narcissist uh -huh. and then ended up a complete flop at, at, at showing that. Um, I know there's, there are instances where you know, they get it part right and then part right. wrong in the ways that I've just mentioned. But I, th I think um, that, um, that there's nobody it's that just... immediately springs to mind. Uh -huh. Yeah, because actually the variety that you just, that you just mentioned where uh, there's some sort of redemption, uh, one, of the, one of the best uh, representations from the last few decades, uh, in my opinion, is uh, uh, the the uh, characters in the movie Dangerous Liaison. Yes. And 
Mm-hmm. And uh, and of course, uh, Vicon de Valmont, he has at the end, he has this yeah. come to Jesus moment. Yeah, exactly. And it's like it's, hitherto yeah. such an interesting character and so mm-hmm. entertaining. And then it's like, oh, he seems to have got a conscience from somewhere. Where did that come from? Oh, right. no, 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 <laughs> no, no. And uh, ordinarily that, that wouldn't happen. But again, they require mm-hmm. that for the purposes of the film. I mean, what you do find is that there are... Mm-hmm some fairly decent representations that get there sort of 75, 80, 85 percent of the way. Uh, And what I often say to people is, as many people come to me and they ask about fictional uh, portrayals, and I say Mm -hmm. there's much that can be learned from them, but what you've always got to keep in mind, it's a TV narcissist. So you're not going to get it all exactly spot on. You're going to end up with sections of it which will largely be a good representation so take for example if you wanted um, an example of a middle lesser okay Mm -hmm. so doesn't operate with uh, a facade uh, generally a bit of a dead beat but may have some gainful employment and uh, albert mister from the color purple is a good uh, Mm. example of that he treats uh, Sully as an object. He beats her, uh, treats her like an animal. When he has sex with her, there's no connection whatsoever. He hides correspondence that's sent to her, and uh, he comes across, you know, he's a rather base individual that uses physical violence. He makes no pretense of hiding that violence. He tries to rape Nettie. He exhibits heated fury. He kicks Nettie out. And when uh, Sally fails to work, he bullies her and again demonstrates an ignited fury. But mm-hmm. one of the problems with that is that so so far, so fairly decent a representation of a middle lesser, but then he exhibits change, which of course wouldn't happen. And therein lies a misrepresentation. So prior to that, pretty decent uh, showing of what a middle lesser would be like with that repeated uh, demonstrations of ignited fury that aren't hidden. What you see is what you get, uh, but then they don't get it the whole way. The problem is, is that they can't make um, the villain or uh, such individuals wholly hateful. There's got to be, for the purposes of the entertainment, there's got to be something. Now, it's even like Darth Vader, or, 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 you know, I mean, I remember watching this and again, I was so disappointed that rather than when the, you know, the emperor is sticking it to Luke Skywalker in Return of the Jedi and should have easily offed him. He decides, oh, I'll pick up, uh, Darth Vader decides I'll pick up the emperor and chuck him down a shaft. No, what are you doing, you clown? Polish off, polish off Skywalker. He's a whiny brat. But again, they, they have to have these things and... Uh, I remember somebody, uh, there was somebody that asked me, I think it was about uh, Anakin Skywalker as to where I put him. And mm-hmm. uh, and I said, well, they asked me about Darth Vader. And I said, well, you, you've got to do a contrast because you he's essentially two characters. He's Anakin Skywalker, then he's Darth Vader. Right. And the two actually are, are not that alike, other than the, the fact that they're both narcissists. Because Anakin Skywalker is this whingy little brat who actually thinks he's kind. But he's prone to these huge petulant outbursts and he's preoccupied with believing that he's the best when he actually isn't. So I'd stick him as a lower mid ranger that he has this intermittent facade. So he he shows this manufactured kindness to uh, Padme. And then, of course, he has the petulance of uh, going in and he doesn't get his own way. So he slaughters all the younglings and he thinks he's he thinks he's really good and he knows better and won't listen to Obi-Wan Kenobi, etc. And then, of course, when he metamorphosizes into Darth Vader, well, Darth Vader's a completely different beast from Anakin Skywalker completely. Right. Well, that that is actually funny in the context of people constantly asking you if uh, a narcissist can travel in between the schools. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, and and it, it's yeah. a it's a fair it's a fair question. It's a fair right. question okay. because. Well, um, mm-hmm. A narcissist, there'll be adjustments around the edges, but the the school will never, ever uh, alter. That's fixed. But it's not helped by such things as that which I've just described, because you'd put Darth Vader in as a lower greater. 
knows what he is, hugely calculating, has that military approach to things, uh, whereas Anakin was uh, lower mid-range. And so people would think, well, Anakin became Darth Vader, therefore that's a narcissist that's changed. No, it isn't. It it, it, it isn't. You just have to take them as two separate characters. Mm -hmm. Well, with the caveat of uh, what you explained, that fiction uh, uh, has adjustment for uh, the reader and the viewer to uh, to to pull them in, mm. and so it's not entirely accurate. Uh, can we uh, just um, uh, briefly go through uh, the schools and maybe the cadres, if relevant, okay. and uh, point out examples, uh, and maybe start at the bottom? Okay. So, but, okay. So with the with the lessers, um, mm-hmm. we have lower lesser. And as we've been talking, I've been trying to uh, rack my mind to find an out and out loser that's also a narcissist um, that's been portrayed in film. And I have to confess I'm struggling because ordinarily what they tend to do in the film is you have the sort of lovable loser rather than the sort of out and out one. So I'm drawing a blank with regard to screen portrayal of a lower lesser. If it comes to me, I'll revisit it. Middle lesser, I've just mentioned earlier uh, on. Actually, what may I suggest, it's not it's not a film representation, but um, John Raffles in Middle March, would he qualify? I'd have to think about that. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you for the suggestion. Otherwise, it might be some secondary character from a um, from a mafia movie, somebody who is completely unimportant but kind mm-hmm. of evil in the wings, maybe. But I also I, I couldn't. I, Raffles was the one example that I came up with. Okay, uh, as I mentioned with Middle Lesser, uh, so Mister from the Color Purple, mm-hmm. uh, and then within the uh, lessers, move on to the upper lesser. A and B. So upper lesser A, affable asshole, Mm -hmm. asshole, being British. And (laughs) I think an excellent example there is Steve Stifler from American Pie. Mm -hmm. He's utterly vacuous. He's amused by petty and superficial things. And he wants to ruin his friend, supposed friend Finch, by exposing him as a geek. And an apt description for Stifler is... He's mate to everybody, but friend of nobody's. So he's, hi, hello, chats away to everybody, but he hasn't got a friendship with anybody whatsoever. He's prone to ridiculous boasts. For instance, he he claimed to have bedded 23 girls in his freshman year. And that's very much your upper lesser type A who behaves like the dog with six dicks. Never really listens, but he's not particularly malicious. Upper lesser type A are almost sort of malicious by accident. And they're more annoying Mm. with the bullshit that they spout. They sort of have that Duracell bunny enthusiasm about everything. And he's only interested in girls and partying and winding up other people. He jumps to conclusions. He exhibits magical thinking. For instance, he's Mm -hmm. hired to paint a house. And he becomes convinced that the female owners are lesbians. And uh, he obsesses over this, even though there's no evidence to support it. And later on, he apparently becomes an amateur soft porn director. And his only contact that he has with his brother is through letters and postcards from filming locations showing the superficiality by which he behaves and he has no genuine connection and uh, the way that he, you know, he drifts from job to job. So he's a, I think he's a pretty good representation of an upper lesser type A, uh, mm-hmm. that sort of really vacuous character that you kind of find entertaining and you can tolerate in doses. But ultimately, everybody thinks that he's a dickhead behind his back. So, what about Cleaver Green? Who, sorry? A Cleaver? I'm probably oh, Cleaver Green from Ray. Yes, right. Now, Cleaver's a fascinating character. Um, he has shades of the upper lesser type A about him because he right. can be a buffoon, but he does manifest cognitive empathy, which would exclude him from upper lesser type A uh, because he shows cognitive empathy towards, uh-huh. towards Barnyard and also towards uh, his son. So, uh, you know, for instance, when he he wants to, uh, when uh, Barney's got cancer 
and uh, when he's got testicular cancer and also with regard to his son and his schooling and so forth but he drifts in and out so he's particularly intermittent i mean there's no doubt about it that cleaver green is a narcissist uh, I mean, his cognitive function, you would find somebody you can find in uh, very intelligent upper lesser type A. Um, but I would be more likely to place Cleaver Green as upper mid range because he operates on this this facade of superiority. He's, uh-huh. su- he's successful in the sense that he's a very good advocate. He tends to win a lot of cases, but then he doesn't have the... Uh, he's financially haphazard he has in difficulties with regard to drug taking and uh, getting getting drunk uh, he's a natural showman so he's very strong on the grandiosity and the showcasing that he engages in uh, for instance when he attends i think it's when scarlet becomes silk and he attends a party and most people are ignoring him he doesn't let it get to him he just carries on basically arsing around around the pool entertaining himself right. uh, until the extent that he gets some attention from somebody so again um he he if i was going to place him somewhere i put him up at mid range but mm-hmm. there is a healthy sliver of, of upper lesser type a about his behavior where he clowns around and can be very superficial but then all of a sudden he will start quoting uh from literature and philosophy to is it, is it wendy his uh it's wendy isn't it his wife i think so yeah uh, yeah uh, and quotes all of that to her mm-hmm. so I mean, he's he's a brilliant character no doubt about it he's a narcissist absolutely mm-hmm. no doubt about it but he does exhibit cognitive empathy, which would shunt him into the mid-range category, given the level of charm that he exhibits and given the level of cognitive function that he exhibits and that he operates with the facade of superiority. You would put him as upper mid-range. Mm-hmm. His, his haphazardness then comes in, which will show shades of the lesser because, you know, he lives essentially in a bed sit. He's financially all over the place. Uh, he doesn't even have an office in chambers. Um, so he has that lovable rogue aspect to him as well. So uh, he's a he's a great example and fantastic television. Richard Ross, Roxburgh does an absolutely brilliant job of portraying the character. Right, right, right. Well, would that be possible though in real life? The the amalgam of the upper mid ranger and the upper lesser. You wouldn't see it as stark as that. Uh-huh. So what you what you would have is that. If we chose upper mid-range version of Rake, he would live in a large house and he'd have money in the bank. And he would be having affairs left, right and centre, but he would be Mm -hmm. able to keep that together. If we went with upper lesser type A Rake, you wouldn't have the demonstrations of cognitive empathy that emerge from time to time. Instead, it would be Oh, what are you whinging about? It's only testicular cancer, Barnyard. And you know, <laughs> you know, let's crack open a tinny and uh and, and such like. So mm-hmm. if it went down that road, you'd have a greater level of superficiality. You might get him quoting a little bit of uh philosophy or literature or so far, but he, he might well get it wrong or in the wrong context, or it, it would be very superficial so he'd get part of it right and then if somebody asked him more about it he would be uh what and he wouldn't be able to deliver because he hasn't studied it to any great degree so mm-hmm. he is an interesting amalgam of upper lesser type a and, and upper mid range uh and uh, you would have to gain certain things and drop certain things if you were if there was going to be more accurate portrayal of either of those mm-hmm. so that's that's fiction that's really interesting uh, what about lower mid-ranger then? Well, lower mid-range, well, we've missed out upper lesser type B. So oh, we did. Right. Just, yeah, difference. just include that. And I had to pick this, of course, because of my uh, approval of Roald Dahl's work. Uh, Agatha Trunchbull from Matilda. Mm-hmm. And uh, there you have the bully, the bold, brash, belligerent individual. So she takes things over and she's ruthlessly cruel she's malicious she's merciless she's pompous mm-hmm. wicked and unstable arrogant and she's no qualms about harming children 
So there's no, there's not even cognitive empathy. Uh, and uh, I think in a way that the film sort of toned it down a little bit. Um, but also with that, that you have the fact that she's quite a fearful and paranoid individual. So when Matilda attends her house and is making things move around, that really gets to her with regard to the level of paranoia that she has. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's what led to her downfall because Matilda was able to use it against her. But she's a good example of upper lesser type B. No pretense of any kind of empathy because it isn't there. There's no cognitive empathy being displayed. And it's, you know, uh, knuckle down, get on with it. It's my way or the highway. You're useless, you're weak, you're children. You've got it wrong. I'm going to throw you out of the window and, and so on and so forth. So a comical representation, but upper lesser type Bs can often be quite comical because they're just such ogres that you'd almost, were it not for the fact that you'd be frightened that they punch you, mm -hmm. that um, you'd almost start laughing at the way that they lose their shit because they just erupt so much. So I put that in there. Lower mid-range, as I mentioned earlier, would be uh, Anakin Skywalker. Mm -hmm with that sort of fluctuating. What about, about Dostoevsky's Underground Man? Not familiar with him. Uh-huh. Uh, well, that is a character who announces the, the first sentence of the, of the, of the story is, uh, I'm a sick man, I'm a spiteful man. Mm -hmm. and, and then he proceeds to tell the world how, uh, give examples of that and, Mm -hmm. and uh, tell the story of his grievance, but also how uh, he lay out the story, how he humiliates and gets back at the people. Uh, okay. Is that, does he have quite a victim mentality? It, completely. That is yeah. the whole, that is the basis of it. Yeah. He's literally in, in his uh, um, room with no window, or yeah. with the window blocked, and, and uh, he's spiteful against the world. Uh, I, I believe you mentioned once a book that was, the reason I thought of it is um, you mentioned a book which was sort of a derivation from The Underground Man. It was written by somebody else. I, I almost think it was Chinese. But mm -hmm. Something, you, you did mention it. You talked about some other version of The Underground Man. So. Right, okay. Uh, but that's a, it's a really uh, kind of brilliant character because there's there's no redemption there. No. So it gets yeah. that part. It gets that part accurate. Yeah. And what about uh, <clears throat> is there uh, is there regression with the character? Uh, aggression or regression? Aggression. Uh, yes, he describes. Well, he be, well not physical aggression. No, it doesn't no. have to be. I mean, it can be uh, verbal aggression. One act. One act. One one uh, sort of. Uh, infamous act that he does he pulls in uh, a prostitute and he uh, he kind of makes a step towards saving her and he explains to her how if she keeps on doing this thing uh, and this is we're talking about 19th century st petersburg mm -hmm. uh, if, if she keeps on uh, selling her body she will die and she'll uh, things will go very poorly and then finally when she listens to him and when she comes in to um, reform her life he his reaction is uh, uh, what? Why are you doing this? I'm not. I, I don't want you here. Yeah. So. Um, okay. Yeah, but it, an interesting, and definitely interesting character, and I, I, uh, I didn't think that there were any inconsistencies and in, or attempts to make him more likable. Oh, I'll have to go and uh, visit. I think you would enjoy it. Character, would yeah, enjoy it. it sounds uh, more representative. Okay, so that's lower mid range, um, middle middle range A. Mm -hmm. It's quite a number of suspects one might have. I thought a, a, a good one was, and because this often gets mentioned to me, is uh, Mother Gothel from Rapunzel. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, and I thought I'd choose somewhere where you, a little bit different in terms of the dynamic rather than it being often romantic dynamics that happen, but an individual where. Uh, there's a dynamic between parent and child. So she's focused on staying beautiful, of course, and young forever and hoards, um, I think, the flower's power, which gives her this. And she keeps that secret and then kidnaps Rapunzel for the flower's restorative powers and then raises mm -hmm. her as her own daughter and is hugely manipulative with regard to her, but overprotective. And that's the big thing here 
is the overprotectiveness, which is possibly seen by the outside world as somebody who's kind and uh, looking after her, but it's entirely for her own purposes, linked to the, the prime aims of ensuring that she's under control so she gets this residual benefit of the flower's restorative powers. And so she behaves very much like that overwhelming angel. And um, she, what she also does, and this is quite common, uh, and there'll be those that uh, listening who resonate with this with regards to the way that a parental narcissist behaves towards a child, is repeatedly triangulating Rapunzel with the notion that the world's intolerant, of, and that the, um, the fact is that she's making it look like she's protecting Rapunzel when in fact she's keeping her a prisoner and she doesn't realize that and many of the people that I speak to in consultation when I'm helping them make sense of what they've been dealing with often talk about how it was always portrayed to them that the world was a cruel and venal place which of course is the sort of default setting that a narcissist has but this person mm -hmm. I'm doing the right thing by shielding you from all of this I know better for you and I'm only trying to help you etc so I think she's a good representation of that sort of overwhelming angel both in terms of the way that she behaves towards Rapunzel but also in terms of her own excessive vanity and that residual benefit that she's seeking so she would accord with that middle middle range type a the sort of sweet on the outside but underneath you soon see that this person isn't very pleasant at all mm -hmm. uh and this is actually uh made me think of uh you you have quite a few videos about um uh wokeness and political mm -hmm. Uh, manifestations of narcissism and actually it seems like the modality that is used there where they claim is uh, we're protecting you yeah. and and then under the guise of that it is abuse um, uh, of the side that is ostensibly being protected but also everybody else whose rights are uh, rolled back to yeah. uh, protect right okay all right. Well, what about uh, um, our favorite uh, middle <laughs> mid-range type B? <laughs> your, your special one of your specials. Yes, uh, yes the <laughs> walnut bald, shriveled up cowards. Well, I thought about this, and I really wanted to pick somebody that encapsulated the cowardice of uh, the middle middle-range type B, but one that's unusually got themselves into quite a position of power. And the one that I settled on was Joffrey Barath Baratheon from Game of Thrones. Now, people might go, oh, what an interesting choice there, because doesn't he come across as this, you know, complete sadistic psychopath? No, he's sadistic, but he's an utter coward. He has no sense of right or wrong, and he has a temper on him, which a middle middle range type B can have. Hmm don't necessarily show it all of the time and there's a slight divergence there because more people see him losing his temper at court than uh, a middle middle range type b strictly speaking would keep that a little bit better under control but the big thing that for him with middle middle range type b is he's arrogant he thinks he's far superior to what he actually is so he has that mid-range reality gap he's prone to bad judgment calls again because he's nowhere near as competent as he believes himself but he's huge at blaming everybody else it's never his fault it's always somebody else who's caused a problem and mm -hmm. he has this monstrous sense of entitlement because i think at one point he talks about everyone's mind to torment and he, he does behave like the i mean he is barely um you know he's a he's a child himself uh, although his narcissism is fused by this point, I think he's 12 years old at the beginning of the first book. And he mm. he doesn't recognize that, uh, again, th this is the delusion of the middle mid-range type B. He doesn't realize that his behaviors are actually monstrous and evil. He believes that he's a true strong king, that this is how mm -hmm. you behave. So he has that delusion. And he sees his victims as bad people who should be punished. Again, his narcissism has warped his worldview. And what's interesting, he has, um, he's a cowardly weakling. He often expresses fear, which middle mid range type Bs do. All narcissists can express fear, as you know. My psychopathy mm -hmm. 
uh, obviates that for me. But with Joffrey, he regularly expresses fear. And there are instances where he uh, breaks down in tears at times as well, turns on the waterworks. And um, he even, uh, for instance, he is such an individual that he, um, at one time, he he doesn't consider things as being crimes. He just sees it as weakness. And he thinks that he is this kind of hero. And he thinks that he's got this cunning intellect and that he's got this brilliant fighting skills. But he's got these delusions of grandeur. He thinks that he's a mighty warrior. But he was beaten in a fight by a girl, a young girl, and ended up tearfully begging for his life. He gets slapped several times uh, by his uncle, the the the, the dwarf, uh, Tyrion. And again, he's like, he's like, you can't talk to me like that. I'm the king. And he's, I, I can do. Oof. And he's on the cusp of, you know, you can see the bottom lip wobbling as he's under that threat of control. So he and he thinks that his people love him. He thinks that people love him, even though he's universally hated by them. So he's Ooh. fantastic in terms of the level of delusion. But at the heart of it all, even though he plays the big man and there's all this sadistic behavior, he's he is a in essence, this coward, this weakling um, that's that's exhibited. And uh, I think it's a very good example. Again, not completely spot on, um, Mm -hmm. but uh, there are some people who mentioned the saying, oh, you you know, he he would be seen as a psychopath. uh, And I I don't, I say no. I say narcissist undoubtedly, because he's utterly convinced that he's uh, the best warrior. You know, he has these, uh, uh, preoccupations of uh, fantasies is that he can do whatever he wants because he is so capable, etc. But the reality, he has that narcissist uh, mid-range uh, reality gap. Mm. That's that's really interesting. That's a, it's a great example. What about um, uh, Whitnell from Whitnell and I comes to yeah. mind here? Yes, I mean that's <laughs> that's a that's a good choice. Uh, that's a good choice, Julie, with uh, Whitnell uh, again. Um, you know, every, it's everybody else's fault and that sort of, you know, I, I was whinging the whole time and uh, engaging in sympathy symphonies. So, yeah, I think that I think that's a I think that's a good representation as well, actually. Yeah. Where would you put Uncle Monty? <laughs> well, apparently he's a terrible cunt. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Monty. Well, let's have let's see. He's a bit of a raconteur, so there's some charisma there. He mm-hmm. he lacks boundary recognition because, of <laughs> course, he's a, a bit of a sexual predator who's uh, wanted to engage in a bit of embuggerment. Um, he's evidently of money. Um, he exhibits financial largesse. He lets them go and stays in the cottage, but then, of course, you know, just turn, turns up unannounced. Um, how educated, and cli- and how, into bed. How, how educated would you say he is? Because I, I, I to my uh, mind, he, he comes across as a bit of a fraud in that respect. But he went to the other school. So um, I, th- I think he went to Harrow. I think the conversation was, was it Eton or Harrow? OK, yeah. right. Yeah, that's right. So I think he is Harrow. But I yeah. don't know what happened be- beyond that. Probably. OK, there. OK. I would think that with Uncle Monty, you could be looking at another upper lesser type A, the affable uh-huh. arsehole. You know, that's, uh, it, it, you know he, he doesn't take anything particularly seriously. He takes what he wants, but he's he's actually quite good company. But he has a facade. He wants to be this, this uh, uh, sophisticated, lovely um, um, uncle. Well, if if we then factor that in as him being seen as a kind uncle, then that would take him more into mid-range character. Uh, right. So we, we might, in a, in, in a sense, be seeing uh, there might be a shade of uh, middle, middle range A about him where, mm-hmm. you know, he thinks he's caring and he wants to be seen as the sort of cuddly uncle that you can turn to and tell your problems to. So, again, we might be seeing in this instance an, an amalgam. Yeah, and a bit of a victim uh, thing going on because he so as he um, attempts to, uh, uh, to to cross the boundaries, he says that oh nobody loves me and uh, I've been in love with you all my life. 
and uh, yeah so lamenting his circumstances believes uh, that he can love which again would uh, be a mid- mid-range characteristic mm-hmm. and again this whole idea of oh i've always loved you which is uh, a, a narcissistic uh, view that's, and they just met they nearly just met yeah so that's magical thinking that he's exhibiting there right. and uh, that would again be commensurate with many mid-rangers any mid-ranger could adopt that view but again i think that would fit more with middle middle range type a in terms of seeing himself as this kind loving cuddly somewhat misunderstood individual who just wants to love and be loved but then of course goes around <laughs> molesting young men <laughs> That's right. And and um, funny enough, and with no, it, he actually arranges this whole thing, saying he pimps, uh, he pimps his friend to his uncle to, yep. to, get, to get the keys to the house. Exactly. So he doesn't give two hoots. And, mm. uh, you know, he, he shows it, it, with regard to his sense of entitlement, of course, when they, uh, um, you know, <laughs> when, he, when they go into the uh, tea room, you know, so, <laughs> what the finest cakes know to humanity and of yeah. course naturally you know what is it he says i'm i'm a trained actor reduce the status of a bum <laughs> so once again he's engaging in this uh, pity play uh, and that he thinks that he should be doing more now of course many actors don't get roles but as we know lots of narcissists end up in the acting profession with uh, with an owl he uh, does very much encapsulate encapsulate rather so much of a narcissist in terms of you know i should be living better i should be eating better and when i go somewhere everyone <laughs> looks at me he feels that entitlement where they're, they're driving along and he's yelling sluts or whatever isn't it at the women mm-hmm. in the street uh that he feels that he's entitled to pass judgment upon them and it's all very entertaining uh in terms of the way that he behaves but uh, he does have uh, again a strong victim mentality on display Absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah, he's an, he, those are two excellent examples, actually, to uh, to use in terms of uh, Uncle Monty and uh, with Nail. And, of course, provides the opportunity to throw around some of the choice quotes from that excellent film. <laughs> oh, oh, it is a cult classic. Indeed. It is. It is. Indeed. Absolutely. I, I remember the first time that I watched it and uh, when he was drinking the lighter fluid and just ended up throwing <laughs> up over his boots and just thought, yeah, <laughs> when they <laughs> I was talking, you know, about uh, seeing something moving in the kitchen and uh, they, they, they don't go in. And to somebody such as I that keeps a very orderly and tidy and clean house, I must admit my nose wrinkled when I saw the state of that kitchen. Um, yes. Right. But it, I mean, it is, com- it is comically awful. So. Oh, it, it is. Exactly. And uh, as, as you mentioned, rightly so, it is a cult classic. Mm-hmm. Now, Upper mid range. Well, we've touched a bit on upper mid range with uh, Cleaver Green, um, mm-hmm. but I thought there that you would have uh, Miranda Priestley from The Devil Wears Prada. I right. thought it's about I thought it's about time that we uh, had uh, another lady and mm-hmm. uh, glacial superior. You might think that she would be a greater, but she's not because she exhibits the vulnerability with regard to her marriage. Uh, and she would, uh, a greater wouldn't have reacted that way when she thinks that, you know, she's losing mm-hmm. her husband and there's another divorce, etc. Whereas an upper mid-ranger can turn on the waterworks a little and engage in some pity play, not extensive, but it's seen. But that successful, maintains a facade of superiority, is mm-hmm. feared and also respected, but also has plenty to back up she has ability which is what you often find with upper mid rangers they do actually have some talent associated with them so she knows what she's doing with regard to the Mm -hmm. fashion world but she doesn't suffer fools gladly she's impatient she's arrogant she's a poor listener she's invariably right of course which fuels that facade of superiority but i thought um she was a good example of that um Another upper mid range that sprang to mind is uh, Jay Gatsby. Mm-hmm. Of course. Yeah. So again, a little bit more showy this time, uh, with the grandiosity, but uh, and uh, manipulative, uh, but ultimately uh, an individual that gets themselves into problems, notwithstanding all the ostentatious grandiosity that's exhibited, also, mm-hmm. uh, but operating again with a facade of superiority. 
But um, he's taken down by a character who's really close to Kathy. Yes. Well, okay. again, demonstrating that that's why he's not got greater status. Uh huh. Okay. Well, so next one in this category, I would bid for John Crawford in Mommy Dearest. Oh, right. Yeah. Played yeah. by Faye Dunway. Yeah. Is that um, consistent? Yes, I'd, I'd agree. With, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, did we make it into the graders? Yeah, I think we've got time to get into the graders. Mm -hmm. Lower grader, Tywin Lannister. Calculated, thinking ahead, keeps his cool. He, again, you're not always going to get best fit representation, but I think that he, you know, he's that patriarchal figure that keeps the itinerant members. I mean, if you look at the Lannister brood, what a bunch they are, you know, brother and sister engaging in incestuous copulation, uh, a, a, a dwarf that's running around doing his usual, you know, I, I drink wine and, and know things. Um, and, and it's up to Tywin to try and keep this unruly brood together. And he mo more or less does. Um, he shows calculation. There's awareness of what he is. There is not an, a, a shred of emotional empathy evidenced by this individual. And he's militaristic uh, and political, which many lower graders are. So he's mm -hmm. a good fit for that. Do you think Iago is uh, a lower grader? Iago. Yeah, the 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 um, uh, Shakespeare's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Yes, I would see him as lower grader as well, sort of uh, engaging in the calculated approach, uh, preoccupied with the success, the, the ability to be scheming. So, yep, I think that would be a good fit also. Then middle grader. Middle graders, again, have an awareness. They operate with a facade of being a decent person when in actual fact they're not. Mm -hmm. They often are quite, they're the showiest of the graters. So you'll often find them in the entertainment industry, often found amongst philanthropists as well. So they are superior. They have access to great networks, are often wealthy, have an extensive reach, which is used for showing the world. So whereas the lower grader is uh, more brutal with uh, awareness and calculations, the middle grader looks like the savior of humankind and mm -hmm. looks like they're somebody that's going to entertain you, that they're on your side and so forth, but not. And I thought here, John Milton from Devil's Advocate, <laughs> i.e. the devil. Uh -huh. So he's flamboyant, so Al Pacino. Uh, yes. King yes. Al Pacino. Um, basically flamboyant, Machiavellian, mm -hmm. he's showy, everybody likes him, mm -hmm. everybody has a great regard for him, and he makes things happen, and of course he has a, a law firm, and it's always said that, you know, the, the, the lawyers are on the side of the devil, so he runs a law firm which has an extensive reach, which allows this wielding of power, and he's a charismatic individual who understands people, and he uses that understanding to, of course, assert uh, influence upon them so that they do his bidding. So I think mm -hmm. he's a good example of that flamboyance. You any thoughts there? James Bond. Ah, Bond. Interesting. I'd be more inclined to put him as a, a lower grater because oh, huh. I, suppose, I suppose it depends which Bond you're thinking about, actually, in <laughs> fairness. Right. Roger, uh, Moore, Roger Moore, middle right. grater. I agree with that. Roger Moore, uh -huh. middle grater. Daniel Craig, lower grater. Uh, because Craig actually portrays him more as how Fleming wrote him. Um, right. That's more, true. More and, he looks, and he looks like Putin, so. <laughs> well, there is that as well. But he exhibits that uh, single-minded hyper-focus as well that would be associated with psychopathy. So I, I would think Bond would actually, uh, the Daniel Craig Bond would be a narcissistic psychopath that would be a lower grader. I think Roger Moore, 
bang on middle grater, wisecracking, uh, flamboyant, whilst Craig would of course bed the women, more uh, Roger Moore's Bond was uh, more known for, for for doing for doing that. So I think he his flamboyance would fit more with the but, middle, middle grater, uh, holding court with his stories, etc. Whereas with Daniel Craig, he's a little bit more about rolling his sleeves up and getting on with it. So Sean yeah, Connery, Sean, Con- Sean Connery. Mm. <laughs> he's got a bit of both in him, really, hasn't he? He's got a bit of right. the, you know, he's he got more uh, more masculinity and physicality about him than Roger Moore, but he's not in the same mould as Daniel Craig. So I kind of put him on the cusp. Um, I think if I had to pay, put him somewhere, I think he'd probably go in middle grader just. Mm-hmm. Uh, so actually, all the more horrible what they did to Daniel Craig in the last one when he um, has this, um, he turns and he becomes a family man. Uh, yeah. He, he oh, feels yeah. profound empathy for the world. Yeah, exactly. It was, oh, no, no. <laughs> what are you doing? Right. You know, he's there. It, the, the, the proper version of him is that he simply uses people. And in order to alleviate boredom, that's why he kills. And he is merely pointed in the direction of acting on behalf of the good guys, uh, simply because that's what's required. Um, But he could quite easily be uh, an alternative version that would be on the side of the bad guys. Um, He just happens to have picked a side that he's British, therefore he follows British interests. But at the end of the day, it's only because it coincides with what he wants. And he exhibits that hyper focus in the way that he goes about his missions. The fact that he will go rogue at times as well, showing that lack of accountability. Um, right. The way that he treats women, he's a misogynist. Women are just objects to be fucked or to look good on your arm. Uh, any deviation from that, of course, where they might make him a little bit more sort of touchy feely and softly to accommodate uh, mm-hmm. 21st century audiences is a deviation from what he actually is. He yeah. Bond, Bond is a killing machine. Point him in that direction, wind him up, and away he goes. And yeah, and he he doesn't preserve government property. He doesn't. Care no, about exactly. That. Anything. You can, <laughs> exactly. And, and of course, the the running joke, of course, is the world's worst spy because everybody knows who he is. Um, <laughs> but Leaving that to one side, with the usual caveat mm-hmm. of they never get it spot on, the Craig version, narcissistic psychopath, lower greater, more mm-hmm. middle greater, Connery middle greater. Timothy Dalton, he would go in the lower greater um, mm-hmm. uh, bracket also. Um, I don't think we'll count the ones that were in the spoof version of Casino Royale. I think we'll put, mm-hmm. that, put that to one side. Uh, right. George Lazenby. Difficult to say, really, if, if anything, I suppose he'd go in with lower greater, but he didn't do it for long enough to make a, an accurate assessment, I would say. So, uh, yeah, int- interesting to do the bonds. Um, I'm conscious of time, and I know there are other things I want to talk about. So what I would suggest, Julia, is that we finish off with the upper greater. And uh-huh. then okay. I, the, I thought you were going to offer the cliffhanger with the upper greater. No, no, I, I, okay. I will include the upper greater. Okay. Uh, and okay. then I know there were other things we were going to talk about, and we can do that on another occasion. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Upper greater, Francis Circuit, a.k.a. Frank Underwood. Yes, yes, yes. So Francis Circuit to me, because I'm British, Francis Underwood uh, to others with the more recent uh, Netflix version of House of Cards. But I read Michael Dobbs' books and... I did so when I was pretty young as well with uh, House of Cards and to play the king, etc. And, and the final cut. And again, there was a recognition of the character of Francis Cut with similarities to myself. Um, what you've got here is an individual who's on the hard right of the Conservative Party and a Machiavellian MP who was sort of sidelined as the chief whip, who then ultimately, of course, became the prime minister. And in the British version, he was born in an aristocratic family, highly educated at Oxford University. He joined the army and was commended for his bravery and in relation to the capture and interrogation of EDKA terrorists. And then he became an enforcer as a chief whip. So you've got a combination here of massive intelligence, very scheming mind, very Machiavellian, 
uh, innate bravery, uh, a slavish devotion to the application of an ideology. And he would do anything to get to where he needed to be. And he leaked information about a sitting prime minister, Henry Collingridge, and he planned and manipulated as the eminence grees that he is, the downfall of competitors to -hmm. get that position of prime minister. So whereas your lower greater is a little bit more brutal and your middle greater is more showy, your upper greater is that consummate sort of mega mind that sits there, you know, arch fingers together, contemplating that all of the chess moves, sees it all ahead, doesn't need to necessarily be that prominent in the way that the lower greater and middle greater would want the adoration. The upper greater is more about knowing for themselves that what they've achieved. And then he embarks when he's prime minister on imposing his will on a nation. And he does so with no regard for who's affected by it. He abolishes the Arts Council. He reinstates national service. He reintroduces conscription. He outlaws vagrancy. He banned pensioners from the National Health Service unless they paid age insurance and he opposed the welfare state. So there wasn't even a pretense of emotional empathy with regard to that. But also he demonstrates that uh, iron fist approach uh, married with that calculating mind. He murders two of his former allies. Tim Stamper and Sarah Harding to nullify their conspiracies against him. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to make English the official language of the EU. So an extension of him, in effect, he sought to unify Cyprus and deliberately causes a disaster, which kills young schoolgirls for the purpose of provoking a war to bolster his popularity, the, the Falcons effect, which Margaret Thatcher benefited from. So He's Machiavellian, wealthy, successful, charismatic, ruthless. He's the eminence mm-hmm. Greece, he's a string puller. Uh, initially not that well known and focused more on power and high level manipulation as opposed to fame and recognition. So that's why he fits rather neatly with Upper Greater. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think he's an excellent, excellent example. Yeah, and Francis Underwood in the US version, pretty similar, obviously with uh, suitable adjustments. Uh, for all the cultural differences there, but essentially the same kind of individual and uh, irrespective of what you might think about him, brilliantly played by Kevin Spacey. Absolutely. and But also in, in that case, um, Spacey's other characters uh, it, of various type of uh, narcissism, they feed into that presentation. Yeah. And what's also useful uh, with uh, Francis Underwood, Francis Urquhart, is that their wives are narcissists as well. And you have the, the narcissist cementation where they're like two stars orbiting one another, that they harness one another and recognize the benefits that should be there. So, for instance, in the British version, um, and of course, it, it had a parallel story in the US version, whereby he starts having an affair with the journalist. Uh, in, in uh, the British version with Matty Storin and his mm-hmm. wife, his wife allows it. So she has, uh, she's able to assert control by agreement, by consenting to the fact that he's allowed to have a sexual relationship with a young journalist because she recognizes that that's going to aid him in his pursuit of power, which she will then benefit from as she follows in his slipstream. So as a little bonus feature there, we have some narcissistic cementation as well. That's right. Art imitates life here. Absolutely, as is often the case. So there we are. So there's a sort of whistle-stop tour of uh, various narcissists that appear through uh, art and uh, I think through literature and film and television. Um, There's plenty more out there, but those are just uh, a few examples. Indeed, and there are some really interesting new presentations uh, in the last couple of years that are, mm-hmm. I would argue, a bit more subtle. One of them being Tar, the conductor. Oh, yes. Um, the Lydia Tar, and then the most recent one is Sick of Myself, and there are two incredible, but well, there's actually more than two, but the two central characters are um, delicious. So. Yes, you've... you've uh generously mentioned them to me uh, previously and they're on my to-do list in terms of uh, watching uh, as as we've discussed previously so 
Uh, who knows, I might have watched those by the time we next speak and then we can have a more involved discussion about them. Um, Sounds I wonderful. Go, I could go away and do, do my homework. There we are. Well, thank you, Julia, for that excellent discussion, which I'm sure our listeners will have thoroughly enjoyed hearing various examples. It always helped people understand the various uh, characteristics and traits of the various subschools by having real life examples. And thank you very much for uh, articulating your own views and suggestions about those various narcissists. Thank you, Jean.